Hello ladies and gentlemen, this is the third in a series of four reviews that I'm doing on Metal Gear Solid. If you've never watched these videos before, then I recommend starting with the previous two videos first as this one picks up where those left off. As such, this video contains full spoilers for Metal Gear Solid 1, 2 and 3. Metal Gear Solid 3, which incidentally doesn't feature Metal Gear or Solid Snake, was released in 2004 for the PlayStation 2. Instead of adopting the near future setting of the previous games, MGS3 goes back to the Cold War and follows Big Boss on one of his earlier covert missions in Soviet territory. Once again the opening cutscene is worthy of commendation. Tracking Big Boss as he undergoes a high altitude drop into enemy territory, it recalls the bridge scene from MGS2 but on a grander scale. Keeping with the times, the game ditches the codec from the previous titles and instead uses a radio. It's an interesting choice since I've always gotten the impression that the talking heads present on the codec screens were mainly a way to maintain player interest in the conversations. They probably could have presented some stylized split screen view of the radio conversations to maintain this, but chose to place us more accurately in Snake's shoes instead by sacrificing a valuable feature. I like the route they took with the radio and initially it's very charming to see the more low tech solution, especially the little pictures the player can flip through while they're talking. Over the course of the entire story I think it does end up detracting a little though. Once the novelty wears off it's a weaker version of the codec than either of the previous games. Unlike the sparsely populated codec of MGS2, Big Boss can talk to various members of a support team and in fact they're almost perfectly analogous to the support team members from MGS1. Major Zero replaces Colonel Campbell, Paramedic fills the shoes of Naomi and Mei Ling, Sigint provides military information like Natasha, Eva acts as a similar contact to Meryl and the boss parallels Master Miller. Of these characters the boss is the most important which is why she's given a lot of radio time right at the start where her relationship with Snake is clearly established. While I think it was the right decision to introduce the boss so early, there's a really questionable amount of thematic exposition thrown into her dialogue right from the get go. She basically spells out the main theme of the story immediately, talking at length about the soldier's place in war and how the times change allies and enemies. Listen to me Jack. Just because soldiers are on the same side right now, doesn't mean they always will be. Having personal feelings about your comrades is one of the worst sins you can commit. Politics determine who you face on the battlefield. It almost seems like the boss is prepping Snake for the unfortunate events to follow much later in the story. It doesn't seem like something which would be on the boss's mind at that particular moment though, since you would be well used to that aspect of war and it sort of comes out of nowhere when Snake is asking what makes a good soldier. I feel like the timing on this is just a little bit misplaced and I think it would have felt a lot more natural had it been placed into the start of Operation Snake Eater a little while later, since it's only once the virtuous mission is completed that the boss knows Snake will eventually have to kill her. Then not only would the underlying message still be just as strong but the words would mean a lot more since the boss would have an ulterior motive for saying them. This isn't the only bit which feels out of place during the opening scenes. At the start the Major mentions to Snake that anyone could be listening into their conversations. You're already in enemy territory and somebody might be listening in. Not long after that he goes into great detail about the operation including the fact that Snake is an American operative. There aren't supposed to be any American soldiers in Russia. It could spark an international incident. He also talks about how survival will be paramount but earlier states that they have a four hour time limit on the virtuous mission. If the game hadn't been broken into two separate operations this would all make a lot more sense. I know there's a lot of crazy stuff in the series so you have to be willing to suspend your disbelief to some degree, but these are basic story inconsistencies that are glaring and completely unnecessary. Shortly after this introduction is complete, the boss introduces the largest new gameplay element in MGS3, the Camo Index. Since the game takes place in a jungle rather than the industrial environments of the other games, Snake is expected to use camouflage to blend into his surroundings. The Camo Index sits at the top right hand corner of the screen and gives the player an indication of how tough they are to see. It's a sort of analog version of the stealth camo from the previous games. 100% means Snake is invisible and low or even negative figures mean Snake sticks out like a sore thumb. The Soliton radar has also been removed, instead replaced with some much more low tech, less useful equivalents and the guards have been gifted vastly improved senses. This all works together to make MGS3 much slower paced compared to its predecessors. 
Snake often needs to crawl around in the grass and slowly take out the guards in an area since the removal of the radar and the increased vision of the guards makes running around much more difficult to get away with than it was before. The camo system has its ups and downs. Blending into the environment itself is great. The player needs to pay attention to the various textures in the environment and match up as best they can to remain unseen. The tall grass adds another element to the mix and Snake's movement itself acts as a modifier as well. The slower he moves, the harder he is to see. The player has enough factors to consider to make things interesting. The final element are Snake's clothes themselves, which can be changed from the camo menu to more closely match the environment he's in. This is handled by a menu system which becomes a major problem. Going into the menu to change the camo eats up a serious amount of time and disrupts the experience. The menu usage in MGS3 is perhaps the biggest problem with the game now, but the original release of Snake Eater suffered from something worse, the adherence to the top-down camera standard from the rest of the series. The later re-release of Subsistence included a much more traditional third-person camera which was pulled down to ground level and controlled with the right analog stick. I can certainly understand why Kojima wanted to stick with the top-down camera from the previous titles to keep MGS3 feeling consistent with its predecessors, but all the other changes feel like they were designed to work with the Subsistence camera. In particular, the top-down point of view doesn't mesh very well with the vastly improved vision of the guards. For the purposes of this video I'm using the newer camera as I feel it's by far the better option of the two. So much so that I'd consider the camera in the original release to be one of Kojima's biggest blunders with the series. CQC is touted as another new addition, but I'm not sure if you can really call it that. Snake has a slightly expanded moveset when it comes to hand-to-hand -hand combat. For example, guards can be thrown to the ground with ease. But overall, this doesn't have much impact on the game at all. Guards can be interrogated, which is a nice touch, but it's debatable whether this falls under the umbrella of CQC at all. Slicing throats is a nice new move, but it's more or less the same as the neck breaking from the other games. The movements are fancier, but they accomplish practically nothing that wasn't possible in the previous games. That said, they are wonderfully animated, and you can tell how much effort was put into the way this looks and feels. The animations even withstand the scrutiny of being shown in slow motion close-up on the menu screen. Although this doesn't add a huge amount to the game, it does make the close combat options vastly more satisfying to use, which is a benefit in and of itself, even if the player will never really be forced to use them at any point. The general changes from MGS2, like first person aiming, persist, and layering these with the new stuff in MGS3 produces something vastly different from MGS1. The stealth premise is common to both games, but the comparisons start to run thin pretty quickly. MGS3 is a far more methodical, slow game than MGS1 ever was, but I don't think either approach is inherently better than the other. There's a lot of satisfaction to be gained from the speed at which MGS1 proceeds. It helps the player to feel much more skilled and the results are binary, either Snake makes it through an area undetected or an alert phase happens. This simple nature of being detected or undetected makes success that much more satisfying since it's absolute. Skilled players well used to the game can get through MGS3 at a decent pace, even rivaling MGS1, but most players are unlikely to manage it and it's not designed to be played this way. Getting through an area usually necessitates shooting the guards or at least allowing them to become suspicious that Snake is nearby. This combined with the slower movement makes the success feel a little less absolute than MGS1 which was a far more arcade-like experience. Despite this, I'd have to say I find MGS3 more satisfying. Before I played the game, I would never have guessed that lying in grass and moving along at a snail's pace would make for a very satisfying experience, but it does. It feels downright predatory. It's a wise idea to stick to the tall grass as much as possible, almost like an animal. But unfortunately, instead of pouncing on the prey, all it takes is a single headshot from long range. The first person aiming in MGS2 made the guards much easier to deal with than MGS1, but the cramped environments and higher guard density went a long way towards offsetting this change. The environments in MGS3 are more sprawling and open than they've ever been, which makes the first person aiming even more valuable than it was before. It's a little too easy to just pop headshots from halfway across an area until the whole place is cleared out. I feel like this could have been remedied a lot by removing the abundance of weapons, and most importantly the silencers. They now wear down with each use, which would be a nice touch if they weren't so easy to come by. Without the ability to fire silently from across the map all the time, I think the game would have been improved for the better, by forcing the player to get close to the guards to take them out, or find a way to avoid them completely. That sounds a lot more like the essence of Metal Gear than shooting people in the head. There's also plenty of traps in the environment, and it might have been interesting to give the player a way of creating some of these as a way of dealing with guards. Claymores are always an option of course, but they cause a huge amount of noise, defeating the purpose. Going back through an area, a player would need to be wary of their own traps, which sounds like exactly the kind of trick Kojima would love to pull on people. 
Although the guards are easier to deal with when advancing cautiously, the player's patience is pushed much further than it ever was before thanks to the slow pacing. Rash decisions and impatience are punished just as harshly as ever, so it's easy to see how some players might run into difficulty adapting to the slower speed. After getting used to the changes though, it's unlikely players will run into too much trouble as they go along. Thankfully, the series has always been good at accommodating self-imposed challenges. The tranquilizers which were introduced in MGS2 are probably the best example, giving the player a way to do non-lethal runs at the expense of having to use a comparatively poor weapon for the whole game. This option returns in MGS3, and the improved feel of the close quarters combat also tempts the player into trying to use it when they don't necessarily have to. Combined with the large amount of difficulty levels that can be unlocked, it's a game which is really as difficult as you want to make it. Players are given some time to get to grips with the new mechanics on the Virtuous mission. This acts as an extended introduction similar to the tanker section from Metal Gear Solid 2 and introduces several of the characters. Ocelot appears again but in a nearly unrecognisable form. I don't think anyone who had imagined Ocelot's past was expecting to see him making silly hand gestures and meowing to call him backup. Prequels are a tough thing to get right, since people have a way of filling in backstories for these characters themselves, and contradicting those impressions can prove to be disastrous. At first I wasn't impressed by the new version of Ocelot, but by the end of the game I think he becomes quite likeable, largely because of the relationship that starts to form between him and Snake as the story unfolds. It's also refreshing to see an otherwise very serious character treated this way. Ocelot was young at one stage just like anyone else, and it would have been ridiculous to suggest he had been born with the personality he has by the time the later games rolled around. Immediately after the run-in with Ocelot, Snake comes across the boss on the bridge, where she reveals she's defecting to the Soviet Union. The Cobra unit and Vol'jin are also introduced, with nearly all of their special abilities being put to use, essentially telling us these will be the boss fights. Even after the boss assaults Snake, dismantles his gun and breaks his arm, he still reaches out to her when she holds out her hand, which goes to show just how highly he thinks of her. The body language here is great and says a lot in a more subtle way than normal for Kojima. <laughs> Ultimately, Snake is thrown off the bridge and left to float down river. <laughs> Not long after, Vol'jin, being the absolute nutcase that he is, decides to fire off one of the mini-nukes which kicks off the main section of the game. It's noteworthy that the conversation between Johnson and Khrushchev is shown rather than merely alluded to. In previous games, the political motivations behind events were left hazy or only barely touched upon. MGS3 shows this scene because it fits perfectly with the central theme of the changing times. It's also no mistake that the events take place during the Cold War. The relationship between America and Russia today contrasts well with the events back then. Kojima also goes one further and places the boss's history back in World War II when Russia and the US were allied towards a common goal, more effectively illustrating his point. After this setup, the Snake Eater mission begins and Snake quickly runs back into the boss who once again dismantles his gun. There's a clear mentor-student relationship at work here, not totally dissimilar from the one between Raiden and Snake from the last game, but it's made even more explicit here. The physical nature of their fights demonstrates the boss's dominance very clearly. It's practically embarrassing for Snake to have his gun ripped out of his hands and destroyed. Not only that, but Big Boss was described as a legend in the previous games, at least on par with Solid Snake, which makes the boss a force to be reckoned with. Once Snake meets Eva and shuts down Ocelot again, that's when the game really opens up and the interruptions ease off. It's now that the environment really starts to shine. The different areas alternate between being very linear and becoming more open. Overall, I'd say the jungle suffers a little from how wedged in it can feel sometimes, but it was pushing the PlayStation 2 to its limits, and this trade-off allowed the team to maintain the level of detail the Metal Gear series had become known for. The jungle is covered in all sorts of flora and fauna skittering about. There's birds, frogs, snakes, rats, bats, rabbits and crocodiles. Some of these are more complicated behaviours than others. Snake can hunt and ultimately eat the various animals, fruits and mushrooms to replenish his stamina meter, one of the other new additions. The meter works well with the more long-form, slow-paced progress. If it gets low, then Snake's health won't regenerate properly, his stomach will also start to grumble, potentially giving away his position, and his hand will be less steady when aiming. It's a nice addition, not one which would have worked in the previous games, but it's a perfect fit here. Considering the amount of effort that obviously went into crafting the ecosystem, it's surprising it doesn't play a larger part. It can largely be ignored since there's also rations and other food items lying around that Snake can use instead. This isn't to say the addition of the animals is a worthless one. The game would have felt very sterile without them, 
If you can ignore how cramped the jungle is sometimes, it's an extremely impressive environment, thanks to how much life all these animals bring to it. Ocelot reappears again after a while to present Snake with the first boss fight. It's very similar to the Olga fight from MGS2, a first person one on one battle with pistols. It's never connected with me as much as the Olga fight though. Snake can shoot a beehive to disturb Ocelot, but this is a lot less shocking than Olga positioning the light in MGS2 to throw off Snake's vision. It's a fairly straight gun battle as the first boss, something which seems to have become tradition at this point. Ocelot is a fairly normal character in comparison to the Pain, who comes along afterwards. He's somehow able to control hornets and can even fire them out of his mouth. The strange elements of the Pain are not only ridiculous, they're unnecessary. He doesn't make for a particularly good boss fight and his name doesn't even fit thematically with most of the other bosses. Pain isn't an emotion, it's a sensation. I also think it's fair to assume that the Pain, along with all of the other Cobras, set up his attack on Snake in advance. It's clearly supposed to be an ambush. Of every area in the entire game, the Pain picks the single worst place to ambush Snake, standing on a platform conveniently surrounded by water so Snake can avoid the Hornets. Everything about the Pain and his encounter with Snake is contrived. I believe gameplay is king, so I can handle contrived scenarios if they lead to an interesting fight, but here they most certainly don't. It's nothing more than swimming around and firing off a few shots every now and then. Afterwards, Snake ends up in a river where a new type of enemy, almost as bizarre as the Pain, is introduced in the form of the Hovercraft Guards. Their inclusion here is utterly ridiculous, since the time frame for the action is supposed to be the 60s. There's something vaguely retro about them which does help them to blend in somewhat, but the level of anachronism here is off the charts. It's like MGS3 wants to have it both ways. It goes to some lengths to establish a veneer of 1960s spy films. There's a sexy double agent, a British commander, and even the aesthetics of the menu feel somewhat retro. That's all well and good, and mixing it with a higher than normal level of technology would be fine if this was a standalone game. It's not though. The other Metal Gear Solid games had an undercurrent of paranoia with regards to technology, and the near future setting helped establish this. In MGS2, Snake runs across a cipher on the tanker, and this was supposed to be an interesting moment. It was the first time we had seen a small, unmanned drone which could fly around anywhere, an advancement in technology compared to MGS1. By the time the plant section happens just two years later, the ciphers are being used far more frequently. Technology is always steadily advancing in the Metal Gear universe, but MGS3 really screws up this progression. Once again, these strange guards are not only ridiculous, they're unnecessary. There's no point in the game where they perform any duty a regular guard couldn't fulfill very easily. After a bit more trekking through the jungle, Snake arrives in the research lab where he finds Granin who explains his plans about building a walking tank. This connection to the previous games feels far more forced than the other stuff, especially since this conversation would mean next to nothing to Snake at the time. The plans for Metal Gear Rex are shoved in front of Snake's face, even though Otacon was supposed to be the one who designed it. I can only assume as well that this bit where the origin of the Metal Gear name is explained must make a lot more sense in Japanese, because it makes no sense to me at all. Well. This technology will be the missing link between infantry and artillery. A kind of metal gear, if you will. And this magnificent metal gear will mark a revolutionary step forward in weapons development. Metal... gear... <laughs> that said, Granin is a likeable character, and his dismissal of the Shagohad as a misguided project seems perfectly reasonable. Up next is the Fear, who kindly shoots Snake in the leg, thereby illustrating one of the worst new additions to MGS3, the Cure menu. This is introduced at the end of the Virtuous mission, and to begin with it's an impressive little menu where damage inflicted to Snake is shown very specifically, and various tools can be used to treat the wounds. Sometimes it's fine, but a lot of the time it gets in the way of the pacing, particularly during the boss fights. It's massively disruptive to the experience to be in the middle of a boss, but then be forced into a minute or so of menu usage where Snake is supposed to be performing an operation on himself. It's poorly implemented, but I don't think it was necessarily a bad idea. There's certainly a lot of thought put into the various ways Snake can take damage. It's just a shame it forces so much menu usage. I think this menu should have been locked during boss fights so that players would have to deal with the injuries afterwards. Looking over battle scars once a boss is complete would probably be a lot more enjoyable and in a way rewarding. Disruption isn't the only issue though. After healing a few wounds it can start to become tedious because the practice simply involves choosing stuff from a menu. I feel like they should have either removed the cure menu entirely or made it more interesting. It could have done with a bit more interactivity like hammering the square button for a few seconds to keep a wound compressed or making some slicing motions with the analog stick to use a scalpel. 
anything at all would have made these more interesting than they are currently. That said, this would potentially annoy players even more if they were forced into repetitive actions every time they took serious damage. All told, there are four major menus in MGS3. The Cure menu, the Equipment menu, the Food menu and the Camouflage menu. The Camouflage and Food menus, while intrusive, feel much more vital than the Cure and Equipment menus which probably could have been removed outright. I appreciate that the team were trying to take a lot of different ideas and make them work here, but the execution is sloppy. The goal here should be to facilitate players crawling around the jungle, not force them to crawl around a bloated interface. The fight with the fear himself is about as bland as the fight with the pain. I think one of the largest issues with these boss fights is how easy it is to just stand somewhere and shoot them with a rifle for massive damage. The player barely has to do anything at all other than shoot and dodge the occasional attack. They each have a gimmick like previous bosses in the series but they don't force the player to do anything other than move around a little and look down the barrel of a gun. Many of the other bosses in the series forced the player to take on different tasks or at least had more major consequences for underestimating them. This place is littered with traps, but the way the fear moves rapidly from tree to tree encourages the player to stand still and track his movements rather than move around the environment themselves. It would have made a lot more sense to use traps in conjunction with a boss that Snake really needs to flee from. In typical Metal Gear fashion, the next boss isn't far away. This time Snake goes up against the end, an extremely old sniper. In my Metal Gear Solid 1 review, I said I'd probably consider the Vulcan Raven fight to be my favourite Metal Gear Solid boss because of how well it personifies the series. Well, to be honest, I was excluding the battle with the end because it's not just my favourite in the series, I think it's possibly the greatest boss in any game I've ever played. It's analogous to the Snowfield fight with Sniper Wolf from MGS1, but it's executed on another level entirely. Boss fights are typically personified by action. Even in a stealth game like Metal Gear Solid, all the bosses are about Snake taking on opponents with sheer force and a little bit of cleverness. The fast-paced boss music might kick in, the character might seem to be against impossible odds, but through skill, fast reflexes and a bit of luck, they'll pull through. It's in your face, it's exciting, and it's over after a couple of minutes. This boss fight can last over an hour, has four entire areas dedicated to it, and mostly involves crawling around. This is one of those things I think Kojima gets away with that many other designers wouldn't dare to try. It's a bold subversion of the boss fight as a construct, nothing but Snake and the End playing hide and seek for as long as it takes for one of them to get the job done. Best of all, it fits the stealth theme of the game perfectly and it feels like a genuine battle between two snipers. The length of the fight also helps to accentuate the survival system in a way no other fight does and the length of time between each confrontation also helps the cure menu to feel less intrusive. Not only that, but the radio doesn't interrupt either unless the player decides they need advice. Depending on the length of the battle, this single boss fight may be the longest completely uninterrupted sequence of gameplay in the entire game. In short, the fight with the end goes against the established notions of how a boss fight should be constructed, but not just for the sake of it. It bravely risks alienating some players and something amazing is crafted as a result. It stresses all of the good points of MGS3's core mechanics and minimises the interruptions. As if this boss wasn't amazing enough, it's also got a few of those wonderful Metal Gear Solid touches. After the end is wheeled out during a cutscene earlier in the game, the player can quickly snipe him. If they do this, they don't have to fight him later. Another way to deal with him is to save during the fight itself. If the player saves then waits a week or changes the internal clock forward a week, then the end will die of old age. Both of these additions are fantastic and it's noteworthy that they both allow the player to skip the boss entirely. I think this was an intentional decision to allow players to circumvent the boss fight on repeat playthroughs, since it can eat up a lot of time and it isn't necessarily something players will want to experience more than once, even if they want to play most of the game again. Neither method is likely to be discovered on a first playthrough, but both give players a way of avoiding the fight on subsequent playthroughs without feeling like a cheat. Snake has come pretty far already at this point, but the game is far from over. This is one of the biggest improvements in MGS3 compared to the earlier games. There's a little bit of backtracking, most notably at the start, and a little while later after Snake meets Granon, but this is the first in the Solid series which really feels like it has all the space that it needs. It's interesting as well because the environments in MGS1 and 2 were full of geometrical shapes which are a lot easier to put together than the more natural terrain of Snake Eater. MGS3 benefits by reusing the MGS2 engine and coming towards the end of the console life cycle when the team's techniques would have been more refined. It's allowed them to craft a larger and better paced game without any reliance on backtracking. Instead of all the boss fights feeling like they're crammed together, some of them have a fair bit of space between them for the player to breathe. Quality has never been the issue with the Metal Gear Solid series. The stealth elements have always been inherently well constructed and satisfying. 
A longer game isn't always necessarily a better one, but the problem with the other installments was definitely the amount of game on offer. Incentivizing repeat playthroughs went some way towards alleviating this issue, but giving players more challenges to overcome is better than asking them to do the same ones again. This is doubly true for the Metal Gear Solid series, because once the layout of the levels and the position of the guards is known, then much of the tension is drained away. There's also fewer set pieces than before, and most of the areas just see Snake sneaking his way past guards. MGS1 and 2 had a larger variety of obstacles for Snake and Raiden to overcome towards the end of the game, and many of these are pretty enjoyable. Honestly, I feel like variety, when implemented well, is one of the best virtues a game can have, but since those games were so short, it always felt like it was coming at the expense of the core gameplay, which is obviously more important. The variety in MGS3 comes in more subtle ways, like including more water to swim around in, putting Snake into a disguise, or having a helicopter periodically flying overhead. This is vastly different from making Snake repel down a building, because it all fits with the stealth team, making MGS3 much more coherent and focused than its predecessors. After clearing the mountain, the next boss is the Fury. Of all the members of the Cobra unit, he's perhaps the least fleshed out of any of them. He's not even seen until this section begins, upon which he says a few words about his motivations. For some reason, being in space made him angry. Of course, this doesn't make any sense, but it also seems to contradict the Fury's entire purpose. We later learn in the story that the boss was the first human in space in the early 60s, but the Fury was part of the Cobra unit back in World War II, well before he would have gone into space. If I was him, I'd be more angry about the fact that my entire life made no sense. The Cobra unit is set up in a similar fashion to the Foxhound one from MGS1. The roles are a lot more clearly defined than Dead Cell, and labelling them by emotion feels familiar to the animal code names of the Foxhound unit. Unlike Foxhound though, each character gets basically no time to be introduced before they're killed off in their fight. Snake and MGS1 often ran across bosses before their fight, or at the very least they would have a fairly lengthy monologue before the fight began. The introductions to the Cobra unit are very truncated by comparison. Not only that, but the death scenes are once again missing, which is where some of the most interesting moments with the Foxhound unit took place. If the members of the Cobra unit had a little more time before their fights, and didn't immediately explode upon death, then they could have been fleshed out into interesting characters. As it stands, they're not quite as bland as Dead Cell, but not quite as interesting as Foxhound either. The fight with the Fury itself isn't as weak as the pain and the fear, but it's not amazing either. It probably suffers from coming after the fight with the end, which is a tough act to follow. It's similar to the Vulcan Raven or Fat Man fights from the previous games, and while it still doesn't top the simplicity of the Vulcan Raven fight, it can at least be pretty tense. It does also fit with the stealth theme a lot more than the earlier fights in the game, since taking the Fury head on is pretty much suicide. At a time when MGS1 or 2 would be ploughing along through the final bosses or set pieces, MGS3 introduces Groznygrad, a new military base for Snake to sneak through. The indoor areas this time are very different. Thanks to the removal of the Soliton radar, it's much harder to get a grip on where the enemy guards are, so it's a good thing Snake is provided with a scientist's outfit in order to blend in. The objective here is to impersonate an officer called Rykov, who happens to look identical to Raiden. Kojima is poking some fun at the negative reaction to Raiden, as he did in the initial teaser for MGS3, and we're allowed to tranquilize or even kill him if we so choose. With Rykov tucked away, the player is allowed to act out a visual representation of the emotional toll Metal Gear Solid 2 took on some people by having Raiden beat up a bunch of nerds with impunity. This is just a slight breather and it's not long before the story ramps up again. The torture scene is basically set up to answer the question of how Big Boss lost his eye, and it plays its cards well by first of all teasing that the boss may cut it out herself. Ocelot is ultimately responsible though by shooting Snake in the side of the face as Snake tries to save Eva. Once again, MGS3 has done a decent job of answering the kind of questions that fans will have on their mind. There's also a moment where Ocelot talks about torture. This feels a little more forced, but the script doesn't draw too much attention to it, just a sentence to tie it into the other games. Vol'jin has been shown a few times by now, and every single time he shows the emotional depth of a toddler. Eva really nails it when she calls him a sadist. The problem is, that's just about all he is. It's far more cut and dry than the previous villains in the series, since he's set up to be wholly unlikable. Watching him throw tantrums all the time like a child can be irritating, there's a vicious scene where he beats up Snake, and he's never painted as likeable in the slightest. Even though he only has the depth of a puddle, at least I can say Vol'jin works as an antagonist because he's so easy to hate on every single level. Snake inevitably escapes captivity, and after a little running he ends up in a river where the next boss fight happens, if you can call it that. 
The section with the sorrow is another very creative and wonderfully realised moment, and once again it subverts the idea of a boss fight completely. The sorrow's health bar is empty when the fight begins, and Snake has no weapons with which to fight back. The Metal Gear Solid series has never glorified war, and Kojima has moved more towards demonstrating this with each instalment. MGS1 simply talked about the horrors of battles in cutscenes. MGS2 had the guards beg for their lives when they were held up, and gave the player the option to take them out non-lethally, making the player solely responsible for their own kill count. MGS3 continues the non-lethal option, and in this fight forces the player to walk past the ghosts of all those Snake has killed. If the player clears the game using non-lethal options up until this point, then the only ghosts are that of the previous bosses. I'm not sure that a game will ever accurately recreate the harrowing psychological effects that battle can have on the soldiers involved, but MGS3's attempt here is valiant at the very least. Before I move on to the end of the game, I think it's only fair I list off some of the little touches and easter eggs in MGS3 since it includes about as many, if not more, than were present in MGS2. When Ocelot is knocked out at the start of the game, killing him will result in a time paradox since it contradicts the events of the other games. During the fight with Ocelot, the player can initiate a duel by walking up to the edge of the cliff. The fake death pill can trick several of the bosses into letting their guard down, allowing Snake to get in a couple of easy hits. Snake can blow up a helicopter early on in the game, and if he does so, then it doesn't show up during the mountain section. When Snake washes up on shore during the Virtuous mission, panning the camera around will reveal the corpse of the Sorrow. Opening the cure menu and spinning Snake, or Eva, around in a circle will result in them getting sick. Here's an incredibly specific one. In the mountainous area there are vultures which will feed on guards that the player kills. If the player lets a vulture feed on a guard, then kills and eats the vulture, this soldier can be seen later during the fight with the Sorrow. Eight. Even when Snake has full stamina, his hand will still tremble very slightly, and if you watch it carefully, you can see that the trembling is happening because of his heartbeat. Similar to this, it's also great that the side of the screen is blacked out a little once Snake loses his right eye. Eva's medical history has a few interesting entries, including one for breast enhancements. And last but not least, Snake's vision in a cave will gradually improve over the course of several minutes as his eyes adapt to the low light conditions. Once again, I've probably left out more of these than I've put in, and I think it's worth saying that these little touches are one of the main reasons the Metal Gear Solid series is special to a lot of people. The ending kicks off with a battle against Vol'jin. One thing I think Vol'jin personifies very well is the way the Metal Gear protagonists are always put up against hugely overwhelming odds. Neither of the Snakes or Raiden have any special powers, and yet they're constantly thrown up against people with enormous advantages, like being able to control electricity. This is why it's so impressive and satisfying when they finally prevail, because they did so just as a regular human being. Vol'jin is a very intimidating presence, and his boss fight is one of the harder one-on-one -on -one battles in the series, but it's not over once Snake takes him down. The Shagohod is the next stage, with Snake and Eva weaving around Groznygrad trying to avoid it. It's an impressively lengthy and well-scripted chase scene where Vol'jin destroys the entire base. They could have easily shied away from this by just moving the action out to the runway immediately, or using camera angles to mask the destruction, but instead some of it is happening while the game is actually being played. It's impressive to see the Shagohod kicking around a line of tanks while the game is in motion. Eventually this leads into the battle with the Shagohod itself, which was inevitable since it's the 1960s Metal Gear substitute. Unfortunately it feels a little formulaic at this point. It attacks using some front-mounted machine guns like Rex and Ray, and the pattern is basically the same as battling a Ray. Shoot it into threads, then hit the weak point over and over. The chase scene is really the interesting part of the Shagohod, and the fight itself is merely a formality. The conclusion to the battle is one of the most insane Metal Gear moments yet. As Vol'jin fries, his ammo belts are ignited, turning him into a fireworks show for Snake and Eva. Since rain throughout the whole game is always associated with the Sorrow, I'd say it's actually the Sorrow who lands the killing blow on Vol'jin in the end, since he seems to take a liking to Snake after Snake makes it through the earlier boss battle with him. Reminiscent to MGS1, Snake and Eva make their escape by car while Snake shoots down the pursuers, the difference being this time that the game goes on once this section ends. Afterwards there's an escort mission with Eva. Considering the fairly negative reaction to the escort stuff in MGS2, I don't think this section was put in solely for its own sake. I think this is here mostly to act as a buffer between the exciting car chase stuff and the final battle with the boss, which is supposed to be a lot more somber. The escort mission is a way to shift the tone downwards gradually so as not to create a jarring change. Coming directly after the car chase, the fight with the boss would feel totally different since players would still be in an action sort of mindset. 
The boss once again talks about the central theme to MGS3 before the ending. It's been summed up as scene, which is really just a way to make it sound like it fits with Gene and Meme. It might be more accurately described as environment, or as the game says itself, the times. Allies and enemies and really all things are relative, and powers much greater than any of these characters will have a big say in shaping their lives. Although scene is a terrible word to try and sum this up, I would say it fits very well with the larger Metal Gear Solid theme of identity. In MGS1 it was determined by Snake that he couldn't be solely identified by his genes. In MGS2, Raiden begins to understand the value of passing on information to the next generation and how that can shape their lives. In MGS3, Snake and the boss struggle with being caught on opposite sides of a conflict greater than themselves. All of these things show who a person is and affect who they become, so the series ties together very nicely when you look at it in that light. Snake and the boss do battle in a field of white flowers, which makes for a beautiful looking set piece. The boss perfectly matches Snake's skill set. She hides behind trees sometimes, and her clothing makes her tough to see amongst all the flowers. She also demonstrates her CQC again, but this time Snake can sometimes break away before she can do anything, or even get the upper hand, showing how he's come a long way as a student. One particular thing I love about this fight is the lack of music. Once again, MGS3 is ignoring boss fight conventions to stress a point. There's nothing triumphant about this battle. It's two people that care a lot about each other in a fight to the death, and it's not worth celebrating with a flashy boss team. Unfortunately, I was disgusted to learn recently that if this fight goes over seven minutes, the Snake Eater theme starts playing. There's good times to be irreverent by playing this cheesy tune, like when climbing up the ladder earlier in the game, but this isn't one of them. I think it was a terrible idea to play such an ill-fitting, cheesy piece of music over such an otherwise wonderfully executed fight. I can only imagine this happened because of a language barrier. If you don't speak English, and Kojima doesn't, then this music would fit the scene much better. The entire story is very much focused on these two characters and the relationship with one another. Funnily enough, there are times when Naked Snake feels like a clone of Solid Snake rather than vice versa. It's true that the two are very similar in character, but there are some subtle differences. Naked Snake seems more naive during the events of MGS3 than Solid Snake ever has, probably because Solid was raised from birth to be a soldier. You, Snake. You're just like the boss. For the same reason, Solid Snake is hinted at to enjoy battle. No, you're worse. Compared to you, I'm not so bad. Naked Snake shows some affection for a well-made gun, but it seems as though he just thinks of the missions as nothing more than a job. Naked Snake also shows far more desire to include people in his life. He spends the entire game conflicted about the fact that the boss abandoned him, but if she were to rejoin his side, he'd probably be delighted. At the end, he spends some time with Eva in a secluded cabin, and seems a little disappointed when he realizes she's gone. Solid Snake spends most of MGS1 pushing people away, and although the ending hints at a brighter future, the events of MGS2 show that maybe he just couldn't let the job go. Basically, I think these differences exist to highlight the effects the vastly different upbringings have had on what are essentially the same person. Despite this, the two are ultimately more similar than they are different. Naked Snake is painted in a pretty positive light, even though he becomes an antagonist to Solid Snake later in the series chronology. Gotcha this time. The boss as a character walks a very thin line as a female soldier. Writing a woman character into a masculine role can be particularly difficult, since it's easy to make her seem like just a man who's been gender swapped. The boss is not just the ultimate badass of the Metal Gear Solid universe though, there's something very feminine and motherly about her. She's softly spoken and I've always gotten the impression that her comforting relationship with Snake was perhaps the only thing keeping him afloat as he became a soldier. Even though she's ostensibly painted as an antagonist, she never really gives that impression, and her ability to keep Ocelot and Vulgen in check as the story progresses serves to reinforce her status as a character beyond such simple labelling. Her last monologue before the final fight lets the player in on all the suffering she's experienced, having killed her former squadmate and lover, given birth on the battlefield and losing her baby. These stories finally reduce her from being a walking legend and turn her into a fully fleshed out character, painting her in just as positive a light as Naked Snake himself. It's important then that when the final moment comes, Snake isn't the only one to pull the trigger. The game makes the player complicit by having the player do it themselves. This slight change makes this moment a lot more powerful than it would be otherwise, and I think the MGS series could probably have used a few more interactive sequences like this in place of cutscenes. The protagonists in Metal Gear games are always being used, but when MGS3 forces the player to kill the boss, it's not just a cheap way of garnering sympathy. 
The entire game builds up to this moment and the twist about the boss's mission, but Snake and the boss never had any other choice. Even if Snake had known everything in advance, his mission would still require him to kill the boss in order to stop the Cold War from escalating. It's how the game gets to the player on an emotional level, but it's also an illustration of the main theme as well. The story of MGS3 is a lot more simple than the rambling insanity of MGS2, but it's not necessarily better or worse as a result. The two games are just striving for different things. MGS2 was going for a more intellectual, slow-burning payoff, which might only arrive after a second playthrough and some thought about the experience. There's no denial of players' expectations in MGS3. If anything, allowing the player to take on the role of Big Boss is a complete reversal from forcing us into the role of Raiden. Instead of trying to be clever, MGS3 goes for a straight-up gut-punch emotional ending, and as far as I'm concerned, both games succeed at what they set out to do. I think it's fair to say that games developers have so far had a hard time getting an emotional reaction out of people as easily as other media. Even though the ending to MGS3 gets me every time, and I'm sure it's a powerful moment for a lot of other people as well, I don't think I would say this is a great example of how games can affect people emotionally, since it's mostly achieved using cutscenes. That said, the final scene perfectly achieves what it sets out to do, and I'm not going to bother showing it here while I'm talking because I think it would just cheapen it. So So that concludes MGS3. Rather than saying it refines the gameplay of MGS2, I think it's better to just say that it adjusts it. They're not really the same thing anymore once you add in the slower movement and the camo system, but that also means they complement each other well. The earlier games are better for stealth in closed environments, and MGS3 adapts the stealth for more open environments. It does address some major issues though. The cutscenes are a bit less intrusive than they were in MGS2. In particular, there's much more breathing space between radio conversations since the support team don't constantly call Snake with updates on every little situation. The bosses are also a big step up from MGS2, and although they lack the personality of the Foxhound unit, the fights themselves are sometimes very impressive. Apart from some of the bosses and the chase scene near the end, nearly everything in the game revolves around stealth, and there's more of it than there ever was before. It's not without flaws though, some of the boss fights feel particularly weak, and the menu system is extremely intrusive at times. The story is greatly simplified compared to the earlier games as well, so people drawn in by all the previous twists and turns of the series might feel left out in the cold. For me, the pros far outweigh the cons though. A few weak boss fights and a poorly thought out menu system is a small price to pay. Metal Gear Solid 3 has the confidence to stick to its core gameplay right the way through to the end, and the resources to craft a vastly larger and more intricate world than ever before. If I had to guess, given his fondness for messing with players and intricate stories, I'd say that Kojima probably considers MGS2 to be his masterpiece. And while I respect that game a great deal, for me the masterpiece is definitely MGS3. In the next video, Solid Snake returns and isn't replaced an hour in this time in Metal Gear Solid 4. So I hope you'll join me then. Thanks for watching.